Hello everyone, and welcome to Autocrat. This is episode 39, Argonauts Assemble. Yoo-hoo! Slight Marvel parody there for reasons we'll get into later. Before we get into that though, just a reminder that we will be doing a Q&A session in episode 49, so during our recap of chapter 1. Feel free to send us questions on anything really, and it should be a fun discussion. So, this is our episode on Jason and the Argonauts, which I'm sure some people have been looking forward to for a while. We've hinted at it a few times on and off. Now, there is a source all about our story today called the Argonautica by someone called Apollonius of Rhodes. Sounds straightforward enough, however, we won't be dealing with it much today because the version I've been able to get my hands on is very prosaic and over 250 pages long. So that's not practical for the purposes of a however many minute discussion this will turn out to be. However, it does place the target of our story today, the Kingdom of Colchis, as being in the Euxine, or rather the Black Sea. So that gives you a bit of a geographical overview as to where we're going to be. So let's dive into it with the family struggles of the family of someone called Crotheus. Aeson was the true heir to the king Crotheus. However, his half-brother Peleus took power upon their father's death. Now, a prophecy said that Peleus would be killed by someone descending from Aeolus, one of the sons of Helen we mentioned in episode 15, and the father of Critias. Okay. Peleus killed every descendant he could find, except Aeson. Aeson was only spared for his mother Tyro. Right, so a mother begging for her son's life, I think. That gives Harry Potter's vibe. <laughs> Yeah, we won't be getting any Avada Kedavras, however much you might want them. I don't. (laughs) (laughs) However, Aeson was in prison and made to abdicate his rights to power. In prison, he and Polymed had a child Diomedes. Okay, that's interesting, first off, that his wife is allowed in the same cell, and second off, that they had a child in prison. Very much so. To stop Peleus killing him, they cried that if he had been stillborn and snuck him out to Chiron's home in Mount Pelion. Ooh, that's clever. Chiron raised him, just like he'd done with other notable names such as Achilles and Aeneas. A second prophecy now said that Peleus should watch out for a man with one sandal. Okay. Now, why one sandal? Why, who in their right mind only wears one sandal? This only comes back to haunt him after several years, right? When someone turns up in a place they shouldn't, but... Yeah, just look out for someone who's only wearing the left croc, basically. <laughs> also, all prophecies. Is that Gaia that play again? I really hope it is. She just wakes up every century, says something, and goes right back to sleep again. All right. Do take over. Well, like we were saying, this second prophecy only comes true, or becomes applicable, I suppose, several years later, when there is a sacrifice taking place on a beach. While there, Peleus spotted a young man with two spears and a sandal, the other one having been lost to the river Anaurus. To explain why, we need to cut over to young Diomedes, who is making his way over to the area where the sacrifice is taking place. He ends up near a river, and Hera, disguised as an old woman, asks our friend Diomedes to be carried across and had weighed him down in the process, so during this crossing, one of his sandals got lost. Now, Hera was angry with Peleus because he wasn't honouring her enough, so basically she's on Team Diomedes now forever. Well, forever, we'll get to that. Peleus asked the young man what his name was, which seems a strange first question when you think the harbinger of your death is coming for you. Yeah. Well, I guess it would be assassins don't wear name tags, it makes sense. The man said that, well, he'd been called Diomedes, and he was the son of Aeson, but Chiron just gave him the name Jason, I think it was. It's probably not going to catch on as a name. Diomedes is far trendier. Sure. Peleus asked Jason what he would do if he knew someone was going to kill him, as an oracle had told him to be afraid of the man with one sandal, and Jason turned up with only one at court when summoned to this sacrifice for Poseidon. Jason, really not understanding that this applied to him, I assume, answered that, well, he would ask that person to go and fetch the Golden Fleece, possibly through Hera's prompting, but still, seems a bit of a strange answer. Peleas promptly ordered him to, well, go and get this fleece, which Jason should entirely have expected, but presumably he's taken completely aback by this, because... He probably didn't get the hint. No, he seems quite a naive young man. 
Now, we last discussed the Golden Fleece in the form of the Ram Ares during our discussion of the constellations. You remember the Ram that, I think, saved two boys from drowning? It's been a while, I don't fully remember. I do, I do. Well, seeing as a fleece is the wool and I think also the skin of a sheep, that's where this Golden Fleece comes from. So the Ram that saved those two boys is definitely dead now. The Fleece was at Colchis, hanging from a tree with a dragon guarding it. Now, Jason asks someone called Argus to help him out for this quest, and this person built a ship called the Argo. The ship was built on the orders of Athena and had a talking piece of timber in the front. Why not? I don't know why. It seems a very random addition. Does that mean there are some trees that can talk? or How did this bit of timber gain the power of speech? Anyway... The god Apollo then gave Jason permission to bring the great and the good of the ancient world to sail with him. And this is why the title of the episode is what it is, because this is basically the Avengers of the ancient world. Nice. We won't go through all of them, but the more famous names include Theseus, of Minotaur fame, Heracles, Orpheus, Castor and Pollux, Jason's own grandfather Autolycus, and Atalanta, who we'll discuss in a few episodes' time. Achilles' father Peleus is also there, so you can really see this is an all-star cast of just everyone who's anyone. I think there's more than 40 of them, even. Yeah, there's 44 names in total, at least in Apollodorus's version, so we won't go through all of them. So, they set sail and stopped at an island called Lemnos. This island was inhabited by only women who had killed their menfolk because they cheated on them with Thracian prisoners, after Aphrodite made the woman smell for not honouring her. Now, the Argonauts are asked to help repopulate the island. This goes exactly as you think it does. It does? Yes. Basically, the Argonauts have a party, let's call it, and Jason's partner has two kids called Euneus and Nebrophonus. Boy, that's a mouthful. There's then a misunderstanding when they turn up at one realm, which helps them, but they get blown off course and land there again. The second time, the inhabitants of the island mistake them for a foreign army they were fighting at the time, and there's a fight on the beach. The king of that island is killed, and when everything is sorted out, they mourn him before setting off. They also, incidentally, lose Heracles at Mysia. Sure, why not? Now, that by itself seems pretty random, but I promise there is a reason. This is because his admirer Hylas, while out getting water, is abducted by nymphs. Heracles and his friend go to look for Hylas, and the ship sets off while they're gone. Seems a pretty big oversight given how famous he is. Yeah. You'd think they'd have a sound off, like maybe he was number 17, but they forgot to do a roll call. Sure. Now, there's different accounts, including that the Argo herself says she can't handle how heavy Heracles is, and so he's abandoned at Thessaly, but this main one is the one Apollodorus goes with. We then go through a whole series of adventures, including two sons of Boreas chasing harpies through the sky and rocks moving to try and crush the ship. However, we're not going to go through all of that here. We're going to resume our narrative with eventually ending up at Colchis by arriving at somewhere called the Phasis River. Do you want to take it from there? Sure. Jason reports him to King Aetis and asks for the fleece. Aetis said he would give it to him, provided he could attach two fire-breathing bulls to a plow. Right. He should then plant the teeth of a dragon, which Aetis had gotten from Athena as leftover from Cadmus planting them in episode 27. Wow, we're full of throwbacks today. We are. Jason was trying to figure out how to do this, but Media fell in love with him. This is the daughter of Aetis by his wife. She promised to help him with the task if he pledged to marry her and take her on the journey back. Okay. Jason said yes, and Medea gave him an ointment which would make him fireproof. Wow. Quite the deal. Yeah, that's very nice of her. She also said that men would rise up from the teeth. From the teeth, once he plants them. Hmm, that's very funny. Yeah. He should then throw a stone in the middle of them, and they would fight over it, allowing to slay them. Okay. Does that sound familiar to you? This smacks of the whole Cadmus episode. Doesn't he do pretty much exactly the same thing? He does, kind of. He doesn't seem to be mentioned here, so maybe he didn't have time to send a warning message to Jason about what to expect from sewing dragon teeth. In any case, the task goes well. Right. But it is does not hold up his hand of the bargain. His goal was to retain the fleece and burn the Argo down. Feels like he could have led with that. 
I know he still probably wanted to see Jason have fun. That's fair. He Maybe he is a Disney villain. He needs to see this person have their downfall. That night, Medea snuck into the grove and made the dragon sleep with some concoction and stole the fleece for Jason. Right. The Argo then snuck out. The next morning, Aetis discovered what had happened and gave chase. However, the fleece wasn't the only thing from Colchis Medea had. She also had her brother Apsiatus with her, and when he got too close, Medea chopped him into pieces and flung the bits into the sea. Oh I'm my sorry, goodness. why? Is that, that's just so much to suddenly. What well, happened next? Well, the reason for this frankly horrific act is that Aetes stopped to assemble the bits of his son, giving the Argo time to escape. But he's dead! Yeah, I like to imagine a very smug-looking Medea and a very pale-faced Jason looking at her with utter horror, saying, When I said slow him down, I meant something else, like break his rudder or something, don't do this. Now, Aetes buried his son and sent out expeditions, threatening to punish them if they didn't find the fleece and Medea. In the meantime, the Argo made it to somewhere called the River Eridanus, but Zeus threw them off course because of a storm in anger for the barbaric death of Absurtus. The Argo then spoke for the first time in our story. You remember that talking bit of wood that I mentioned like forever ago? Yes. Well, it said that the trials would continue until Medea was purified by Circe on the island of Aiaia. This is basically a minor goddess from what I remember. So, a side quest to Circe's island was needed. After the purification, they came across the Sirens. So, these are the famous women from mythology who sing really alluringly to lure sailors to their death on the rocks. Orpheus stopped anything bad happening by singing his own song to stop the Argonauts getting into the water to head towards the music and the Sirens. So, we basically have an ancient Greek rap battle at this point. Sure. Only one man headed towards them, but apparently Aphrodite just rescued him and took him somewhere else entirely. Okay. He's really giving off Perseus energy so far. Everyone and anyone seems to just help him with his problems immediately. True. I mean, not Absurtus. His problems are very much staying real. (laughs) They also made it past other challenges thanks to divine intervention. Again, really giving off Perseus energy. The pursuing force, however, eventually found them and demanded Medea's return. But the reply of the local king they're staying with, yes, they're staying with one again, don't worry about it, is that if Medea had slept with Jason, they were husband and wife, and Aetes couldn't do anything, with the reverse being true if not. That said, this king's wife hurriedly wed the two. Which seems very predictable. You gotta love legal loopholes, am I right? Always. The pursuing force then stayed there, presumably fearing Aetes' wrath, and the gang set off again. They were next hindered at the island of Crete by someone called Talos, and this is a bronze man or bull which Hephaestus had built for Minos and which threw rocks at the ship. This was during his walk around Crete to protect it, which he did three times a day. The takeaway here is this is basically a robot. Medea is, again, the one who deals with him in most accounts, sometimes by pulling out the pin in his ankle so that something called Ichor, or basically his life force, all flowed out, which killed him. Now, finally, after a four-month round trip, they arrive back at Jason's home territory in Iolcus. Now, Peleas wasn't happy to see them, having hoped that the trip would kill Jason. Such a nice guy. Now, Peleas wanted to kill Aeson, Jason's father, but Aeson voluntarily drank poison and died instead, with Jason's mother hanging herself and cursing Peleus. Poor Jason. Peleus then killed her young son, and presumably Jason's brother, called Promarchus. Jason gave him the fleece, but was not happy. I bet. And bided his time to have revenge on Peleus. Again... What usually happens when Jason has a problem that needs dealing with? Medea takes care of it. Medea takes care of it almost immediately. Yeah. She convinced the daughters of Peleus that if they chopped their father up and boiled the bits, they could give him his youth back. Right. How fun. She did this with a ship, transforming into a slam to convince them. Okay. Now, that's a good scientific principle, I suppose. The daughters do need evidence to see this works. Well, they tried it, but... Didn't work. Oh, that's so unexpected. Yeah. 
She likes shopping people into bits, doesn't she? I hadn't even noticed that was her thing. Their brother, Acastus, buried him and exiled both Jason and Medea for the crime. Yeah, he would do. I like to imagine Jason didn't know anything about this and was just woken up in the middle of the night and told, get out, rubbing sleep up his eyes. And what, what for? Your, your you wife... keep shutting people into bits. Your wife keeps chopping people up. We've, it's leading to really specific wanted posters. This is where we leave off our story for part two, which is most notably discussed in a play called Medea. That should be a lot of fun. If it's any indication, I, th- I planned on calling that episode Medea's Revenge. Ooh. So have fun looking forward to that. And probably to more people being chopped into bits. Um, I'm not going to tell you anything for now about the chopping people into bits quota. You'll have to find out for yourself. It's currently at two. Let's see if Medea's Revenge will beat that. Any chopping of people into bits, potential or otherwise, will have to wait for two weeks from now, because next week we have another Task of Heracles, now that we've seen him just abandoned by all his friends on the Argo. So, in the meantime, we thank you all for listening. Um, Just a reminder again that you can take part in our Q&A in episode 49, and we hope you have a great week, everyone. Have a great week. So, did you like this story? I did. It's a long story. It's nice. Yeah. And it focuses to be close on things in the of the world. Yeah, I suppose it does. He really becomes his own secondary character. Yes. It's a nice story. 